Welcome to the afternoon sessions. There will be two. The first one is entitled Jewish Spiritual Hermeneutics. And uh, this is focused on the medieval period and Hasidut. Uh, it is different than the other sessions because our two participants, Omar Mikhail is professor at Tel Aviv University and Ora Wiskin, professor at the graduate program in Jewish thought at Mikhail Yerushalayim College and Ono Academic College. The two of them were not able to get here from Israel. And before we begin, I just want to say that my thoughts are with you both, with you especially, Omar, since I see you uh, there on the screen. And I hope that you, are, you and your family and your friends are staying safe during this very difficult time. I want to introduce Omar first, and he'll give his presentation. It will be slightly different as well, because we're going to let him take questions and answers as well, so he can retire in the late evening in Jerusalem, in Israel. And, and then we'll have the presentation of Ora Wiskin done by David Gottlieb. Uh, so that will be a, an experience as well. A few remarks about Omer. Omer's talk, uh, The Emergence and Character of Multi-Layered Exegesis in Medieval um, Judaism. Omer is Associate Professor in the Department of Jewish Philosophy at Tel Aviv University. Dr. Michaela specializes in medieval Jewish thought and philosophy in the Islamic world, focusing on the dynamics of production transmission and integration of knowledge in medieval Judaism, as well as its intersection with parallel processes in Islamic culture. His work examines the production and integration of the new in medieval Judaism, particularly in the areas of Jewish philosophy, theology, and Kabbalah. Due out in December from Stanford University Press, his book, Interiority, Interiority and Law, uh, Bachi ibn Pakura and the Concept of Inner Commandments, presents a groundbreaking reassessment of a medieval Jewish classic. Bahi Ibn Pakuda's Guide to the Duties of the Hearts, his integrated, uh, the, this classic, his integrative approach contributes to the conversation in the history of religion, in Jewish studies, and in medieval studies on interiority and mysticism. Please join me in welcoming from Israel, uh, Omar Mikhail. I will just say a word or two in Hebrew and then change to English and I will also share the screen in a, a moment or two. Um, what can I say? Um, אבל כוס הססונים שלי התחלפה בכוס יגונים ואני יושב כאן בארץ עם שאר אבלי ציון מירושלים כואב והמום ומודאג מאוד ובכל זאת יש נחמה בלהיות איתכם אפילו מרחוק ובלהקדיש הרצאה לחברי האהוב ולמורי היקר מיכאל בזי פישבן um, I will try in English. Um, my heart is in the West and I am at the edge of the East. Um, for very long, I eagerly awaited at this event, a chance to celebrate, reconnect with friends, study and partake in Mishte. However, uh, what I anticipated to be my cup of happiness now hold the weight of sorrow. And I sit here in Israel, partaking in the collective heartache of the mourners of Zion, overwhelmed with shock, pain, and deep concern. Yet there is a solace in joining you, even from this distance, and to dedicate a talk to my beloved friend and revered teacher, Michael Vazi Fishbein. As is very well known and celebrated, Michael has delved deeply into a myriad of themes and topics throughout his teachings, studies and works, or to put it in simpler term, his Torah. Amid this vast tapestry, one under, a unifying thread stands out, the question of interpretation or hermeneutics. Multifaceted and complex, this question has been central to Michael's teachings for decades. It is portrayed 
as the fundamental bedrock of human existence, the cornerstone for the existence and for the nurturing of communities, the pillar of Jewish culture, and the very heart of modern theological reflection. Among the numerous avenues of Jewish interpretation that Michael explored with such care and precision in his work, a primary path emerges in his Sacred Attunement, a book that I had the enormous honor of co-translating into Hebrew. Within its pages, Michael introduces a hermeneutical model he describes as new old, referred to as pardes. As he notes, this model is, I quote, stratified into four distinct levels, yet remains interactive and integral at its heart, end quote. The principles of this model are masterfully presented in Sacred Attunement. Its significance as an essential interpretative framework has guided the writing of Michael's important JPS Bible commentary on the Song of Songs, and its evolution as a cornerstone for Jewish theology is expounded upon in his most recent Fragile Finitude. So what exactly is the Pardes? The finest, concise articulation of the richness of this model is that of Michael himself. In his words, the Pardes is, and I quote, a medieval acronym for Pshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. The first type, Pshat, refers to the plain sense or contextual, lexical level of textual meaning, of scripture. Indeed, its canonical frame is the Hebrew Bible. The second type, the Rash, refers to the exegetical sense or the legal and theological levels of rabbinic interpretation. And its vast literary corpora include the varieties of classical rabbinic Bible commentaries. The third type, known as Remez, refers to the allegorical sense, or the philosophical and spiritual ethical levels found in scripture. And its range of sources embraces a broad variety of theoretical and practical interpretations. Finally, the fourth type, Sod, refers to the esoteric or mystical sense or the supernal signs and symbols encoded within scripture, which includes a large spiritual and theosophical literature. Over the millennia, these hermeneutical levels produced a great diversity of scriptural meaning. In my presentation, dedicated to Basel, I aim to very schematically map out the emergence of this idea, tracking its first appearance and anchoring it within the Middle Ages. Rather than delving into the Pardes itself, the fourfold model, my focus will be on the Pardes's underlying principle, the existence of the idea of multi-layered exegesis. I intend to contrast this principle with what I perceive as the preceding dominant interpretative pattern, emblematic of the rabbinic approach to scripture. In contrast with earlier rabbinic approach, whose exegetical modus operandi involved horizontal exegesis, namely the presentation of exegetical alternatives on one axis of significance, numerous medieval thinkers and commentators contended that scripture is characterized by different and distinct layers of textual meaning, which exists on a vertical axis. According to such a view, scripture is to be interpreted on the basis of associating the various interpretations with these different layers of meaning. This con concept of multi-level exegesis was to, to change the face of Jewish exegesis and brought with it the emergence of various exegetical trends from the extensive enterprises of Pshat exegesis to contextual exegesis in the age of the Geonim to allegorical philosophical modes of exegesis. However, what were the beginnings of this exegetical trend in Judaism? This question has not yet been systematically addressed. I will try to show that the first occurrences of the idea of multilayered exegesis appear in the exegetical enterprises of Geonic and Karaite authors in the 9th to 11th centuries. In order to fathom the transition from earlier 
late antique rabbinic um, to the medieval modes of interpretation, a few, if very general, words must be added on the exegetical approach that characterized both Tanaitic and Amoraic interpretation, from the stratum of the earlier Midrash Yalacha to the later compilations of Midrash. According to the rabbinic conception, Midrash works most prominently by the gathering of different verses together. This process of gathering uproots the verses from their original context and creates unavoidably a new context altogether. The modus operandi is decontextualization, involving aberration from the context, from context by utilizing different modes of literal similarities, proximities, and thematic links, which result from the idea that the whole of scripture is the relevant context for each and every verse. Moreover, the various exegetical alternatives that are produced in this method are seen in general to be positioned in an horizontal relation with regards to each other. They do not reflect different levels or degrees of depth, but are presented solely as different options, in some cases mutually exclusive and in others equally valid. Though some, albeit rare, Cases of allegoric, allegorical interpretation can indeed be found in rabbinic literature, as shown most prominently by Menachem Kister. No use of technical terms and no systematic employment, let alone articulation of the idea of layered interpretation, can be found in this mammoth body of literature. Let us briefly examine an example in, uh, to which we shall also return later of late antique rabbinic horizontal exegesis. This example is taken from Tosefta from Tractate Sota, in which a verse from Proverbs is interpreted. Uh, the verse goes, prepare your work without and make it ready for yourself in the field and afterwards build your house. Achen b'chutz melachtecha v'atedda l'basadelach achar uvanita beitech. It is interpreted thus, prepare yourself without, this is a house, and make it ready for yourself in the field, this is a field, and afterwards build your house, this is a wife. Another, another matter, davar acher, prepare yourself without, this is scripture, and make it ready for yourself in the field, this is Mishnah, and afterwards build your house, this is Midrash. Another matter, Rabbi Eliezer, son of Rabbi Yosei Aglili, says, prepare yourself without, this is Talmud, and make it ready for yourself in the field, this is a good deed, and afterwards build your house, come and collect your reward. Notably, what distinguishes between one interpretation and the next, and this is repeated innumerably in rabbinic exegesis from late antiquity, is the compound another matter, davar acher, which basically means alternatively. The presentation of these alternatives does not indicate in any way the possibility that they reflect distinct layers of the meaningfulness of scripture or any other general exegetical principle that distinguishes between them. In contrast to this late antique rabbinic conception of hermeneutics, one can trace, beginning from the late 9th century, in both Rabbinite and Karaite exegesis, the emergence of the vertical principle, according to which there lies a distinct layer of inner interpretation beneath the external layer. These, ex these exegetical layers were also subject to technical terminology in Judeo-Arabic, drawn from Arabic, of course, uh, from Arabic and Islamic discourses. The external layer was referred to as zahir, meaning the manifest, exoteric meaning, and contrasted with the non-manifest, meaning button, that is inner, inward, or interior. The emergence of this trend in 9th to 11th century Judaism crisscrosses schools and ideologies, and is manifested in the thought and exegetical enterprises of such rabbinite authors as Saadia Gaon and Shmuel ben Hofni Gaon, 
as well as in Karite thought and exegesis in the works of Yaqub al Kirtisani, Daniel al Kumisi, who wrote in Hebrew, Yefet ben Eli, and Salmon ben Yerucham. Interestingly, this mode of exegesis is not accompanied in most cases by any theoretical formulation or reflective account that seeks to explain it. Moreover, in some cases, there are significant gaps between the programmatic assertions that these exegetes do make with references to their exegetical methods and their exegetical praxis, that is, the way they actually interpret scripture. Such a case is to be found uh, in the writings of Saadia. Saadia Gaon lays down uh, his rules for the interpretation of the text of scripture in, system in a systematic fashion, in Judeo-Arabic, in various places throughout his oeuvre. In all these cases, there is no significant difference in Saadia's mode of presentation, which is uh, founded on an epistemological exegetical axiom that, and I quote from an oft-cited passage from his Kitab al-Amanat wal al Itikadat, every statement found in scripture is to be understood according to its literal sense, al zahir except for those that are impossible to understand according to their literal sense, for one of four reasons, namely, the first, when it is repudiated by sense perception, by sense perception. two, when it is refuted by reason, Archive. Three, when it is contradicted by another unambiguous biblical passage. Or four, when it is qualified by a rabbinic tradition, in which case we must, we must interpret the statement in a manner consistent with correct tradition. Se'adia equates the term, the term Zahir in another context with Al-Mashhur, signifying the well-known or conventional linguistic semantic sense. According to Se'adia, only when the literal or apparent sense of the biblical text runs against one of these four parameters, another interpretation is to be offered. Although Se'adia does not elaborate on the specifics of such alternative mode of interpretation that is to be proposed in such a case. However, these programmatic statements do not fully reflect Seadia's actual exegetical praxis, which, in a large number of cases, is not restricted by the constraints he emphatically announces. Such cases feature the employment of multilayered exegesis even when where no exegetical challenges of the type Seadia referred to are present and no deviation from Zahir interpretation seems to be necessary. An example is in order. This example involves an adaptation in Judeo-Arabic of earlier Midrashic materials and the reorganization of these materials in the framework of layered exegesis using the term Zahir and Barton. Saadia argues that a verse from Proverbs, Proverbs, Mishlei, um, 11, chapter 11, verse 1, the even shlema retsono. Paul's scales are an abomination to the Lord and an honest way pleases him. Is to be interpreted in two manners. The first, alizahira, that is as is commonly understood, namely, as an admonition against uh, fraud in weights and measurements. The second, tibartina, that is an implied, non-manifest interpretation. According to this interpretation, argues Saadia, the honest way implies that one ought to repay a favor with a favor. And the false scales imply that one must not repay good with evil. This interpretation, according to Saadia, is the inner meaning of the verse that is only hinted at in scripture. It is possible that, the, uh, that Se'adia drew this inner interpretation from an earlier rabbinic source, Sikta de Rav Kahana, 
which features an Aramaic dictum, repay a favor with a favor and an evil with an evil. This dictum is followed by historical, so to speak, negative examples from the relationship between Israel and both the Edomites and the Amalekites. Immediately following this in the Psikta is another Midrash, in which the aforementioned verse from Proverbs is interpreted, although it is given a different interpretation. It is possible that the vicinity of the two exegetical units caused Se'adia to conflate the two and to bind the dictum of the first to the verse that is interpreted in the second, referring to it as, as its hinted interpretation. At any rate, to our concern, it is important to know that the exegesis is no longer horizontal, but now organized on the basis of inner and external, depth and surface. Moreover, it is evident that in this case, there is no necessity of interpreting the verse in a way that deviates from the Zahir, but it instead, it involves an exegetical decision that is not accounted for in Sa'adia's list of rules of interpretation. Finally, we have seen how Sa'adia reorganizes earlier Midrashic material according to a new exegetical framework that features distinct layers of interpretation separated by their degree of interiority. Thus, even when the content of the interpretation may be familiar from previous contexts, the modus of presenting this content and the meaning of this mode of presentation is now different. In another case, an interpretation of Proverbs 24-27, Teadia presents not two, but three layers of understanding one verb. Two of these layers, Zahir and Barton, are re recognizable from the previous example. The third layer is defined by Se'adia as being the layer of secret, the. The verse is familiar by now. Prepare your work without and make it ready for yourself in the field and afterwards build your house. With regards to its Zahir, Se'adia writes, the plain sense Zahir of this verse is a counsel for he who aims to marry a woman. He shall not do so before he, he has proper income, and he knows that this income can provide for one or two children. When he marries in such conditions, he will only have to make sure that this income is permanent, and he can rely on God in this. According to this interpretation, a house signifies a wife. This very interpretation, as we have seen, is already present in Tosefta Sukkah. As we've also seen, the earlier source includes several alternative interpretations of this verse, and it is possible that Se'adia transformed the horizontal framework of different interpretations and adapted it to the new vertical framework. In any case, the earlier source is used here by Se'adia as part of the external or manifest layer. It is also noticeable that Se'adia considers the movement from a house to a wife to be so obvious, so much part of the Zahir, that he does not see any need to support this interpretation by any scriptural proof text. The second layer presented by Se'adia is the Bartina. According to the inner sense of Bartina, one has to begin by taking care of the necessity, necessary needs of this world uh, before those of the world to come, al akhira I skip. According to this interpretation, a house signifies the world to come, or the hereafter. In this case, too, there is one discussion in the Babylonian Talmud that, that associates the words your house, although not specifically referring to this verse, with the idea of the world to come. And it is not unlikely that Se'adia bases his pattern interpretation on this earlier source. The third layer presented by Se'adia is that of secret. Uh, in Arabic, in Sirayra, of, of the secrets. There are introductions to wisdom, which are like the corridor of the, of the house. You should not turn to this philosophical part of learning without beginning with these introductions first, since it is the introduction which will open it for you. The Greek language, calls the introductions to every science 
such as logic, astronomy, geometry, and medicine, is a gog, is a gog, as transliterated in Arabic. The commandments, too, have introductions that are necessary. One will not benefit from the former without the latter. In this, I mean, the commandments of revelation, al samia such as fasting, Sabbath, pilgrimage, and unleavened bread, one will not gain any benefit from them unless they are preceded by commandments of reason, alaklia, such as equity, justice, and rightfulness. One must perfect one's conduct with his neighbor and only then turn to what is between him and his Lord. In this final interpretation, Saadi establishes an order of precedence in the life of worship. This interpretation, as far as I can tell, is unique to Saadia, at least with respect to the way it makes an, an analogy between the rational commandments, which in this case refers refer to interhuman conduct, and the introductions to the different sciences. Such commandments are considered as a prerequisite uh, before one proceeds proceeds to the commandments of revelation, which are in this formulation the commandments between man and God. We can thus discern in this example as well the emergence of the principle of multilayered exegesis in Sa'adia. It is clear that different interpretations do not exclude one another. All three, each in its own way, are correct. But they are not correct in the same manner. Instead, they reflect different level of understanding. Another thing to notice is that the two examples are taken from Saadia's commentary on Proverbs. It is not, this is not coincidental. A preliminary study of all of Saadia's exegetical corpus shows that significant part of his use of multilayered exegesis takes place in this specific biblical book, in which both interpretations are more prevalent than in any other work uh, or in any of the other of his exegetical works that have survived. Why is this so? In the beginning of his commentary on Proverbs, Saadia argues that the book is called Mishlei Proverbs because, I quote, when the intellect wants to educate one's nature, it uses the form of mafal to convey what is manifest to the intellect but hidden from nature, end quote. The topography of scripture, so to speak, is thus uneven. There are books that are predisposed to this mode of interpretation, while others, while others are, le are less so. The exegetical modus of multilayered interpretation does not apply equally to the whole of scripture. Saadia is not the only Jewish exegete who employs the method of multilayered exegesis. Significant attestations to such use can be found also among the Karaites, the adversaries of the rabbinite school and social trend to which Saadia belonged. Even though the first stages of the, in the development of this school can be found in the 8th and 9th century in Persia and Babylonia, it has reached its apex in the Jerusalem center between the 10th and 11th century, uh, in the Fatimid age. In the Karaite context, one can trace two different different trends with respect to Barton interpretation. The first is most significantly attested in, to in the writings of Abu Yusuf Yaqub al kirkisani a Karaite polymath whose major extant work, Kitab al-Anwar wa al-Marakib, Book of Lights and Watchtowers, was written in uh, 937. One of Kirkisani's statements in this regard very much recalls Saadia's aforementioned are programmatic assertion. Kirkisani argues that button interpretation is to be used only in cases in which words of scripture involves an explicit contradiction with the rules of reason, or in cases in which there is contradiction between two verses. Kirkisani's critique and suspicion are expressed in his claim that inner interpretation is to be used only as a last resort. This is specifically important, although not limited to the case of precepts that are to be interpreted only according to their plain sense. In Kirkisani's words, this principle applies not only to the precepts 
but also to all biblical texts, including narratives and others. In effect, were it permissible to attribute a hidden bottom meaning to certain precepts, different from the plain sense, Zahir, without there being any necessity for doing so, we would have grounds for doing this with all the commandments, and they would become invalid, their true meaning becoming unknown, since the hidden meaning, i.e. the Tao will, might be extended in any direction, developing according to the whims of each interpreter. However, Fikisani himself does not completely abide by the rules uh, of biblical exegesis that he presents. Thus, in his discussion of Deuteronomy 2120, to give just one example, Fikisani presents two possible interpretations that he regards as Zahir, one of his own making, and the other attributed to Daniel al kumisi another Karaite ex exegete. Following these two, he presents, without rejecting it, another interpretation that he attributes to those who accept al-tafsir wa al-ta'wil al batin accept the uh, um, exegesis and the interpretation, uh, uh, inner interpretation. Yekisani, then, does not altogether reject Batin exegesis, and he even presents such interpretation in his own work. Still, he seeks to limit its use and wars warns against it, its unrestrained utilization. In contrast to this approach, it seems that among, Karait, uh, uh, that among the Karaites, there appears from an early stage another approach to the same issue. This is presented by Kisani in his Kitab Al-Anwar wal maraki not as his own approach, but as attributed to another anonymous source. Our book is a, a sublime book in its ideas, but many of its facets are profoundly obscure. In their inner realm, bottom, they encompass sciences or loom that one cannot understand without ex uh, excelling and fully knowing the sciences of proper reasoning and the sciences of logic. In Psalms it is written, open my eyes that I may perceive the wonders of your Torah. If the wisest of all mankind had not known that the book includes wonders that require careful examination, he would not have beseeched his Lord to render them visible. Although we do not know who the anonymous source presented by Kisani is, a similar approach, supported by the same proof text, is to be found in the works of Daniel al Kumis, an early Karaite scholar and biblical exegete from the province of Kumis in northern Persia, who settled in Jerusalem around the year 880. Al Kumis's biblical commentaries in contrast to later 10th century Karaites, are mostly written in Hebrew. His commentary on the minor prophets that survive nearly intact, and some fragments of his commentaries of other biblical books, reveal that according to his approach, scripture includes not only a manifest layer, but also a hidden one. A clear formulation of this principle is found in a fragment of his commentary on numbers, in which uh, al kumisi asserts, know that God's Torah is likened to water, and those who acquired knowledge, masculine da, were the prophets who possessed knowledge, knowing scripture in all its aspects. Why such a thing is written as it is, and not otherwise? Therefore, it is to them that God gave the Torah, offered and explicit, gluyav and odad, on the one hand, but hidden and unseen, Sturav and Elama, on the other. It is profound in its utterances and will not, reveal, will not be revealed to those whose heart is stubborn, but only to those whose heart is sincere, as it is written in Proverbs, if you seek it as you do silver and search for it as for treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and attain the knowledge of God. Therefore David beseeched in his prayer, open my eyes that I may perceive the wonders of your Torah. Why does the hidden layer 
what does the hidden layer consist of according to al Khumisi? In general, this exegete sees prophecies as indications of the divine plan, and more specifically, of all that is to happen to the nation of Israel in the future, until his days and beyond. They also include, in their inner layer, hints on the time of possible redemption. But beyond the content, the form is our main concern. That is, the notion that scripture is to be interpreted according to two different senses, articulated as two separate layers, an external one, that is based on contextual and linguistic interpretation, and an inner one, that is to be interpreted according to another hermeneutical key. This very idea is applicable also to the writings of two of the most fecund Karaite ex exegetes, Talmon ben Yerucham, who flourished in Jerusalem around the middle of the 10th century, and Yefet ben Ayla, active in the second part of the 10th century. In both cases, one can see a general, an, a general proclivity to Zahir, contextual linguistic interpretation, but also the regular appearances of Balten exegesis. To sum up, firstly, one can see in both Rabbanite and Karaite content, and despite the ideological rival rivalry, a similar shift in their hermeneutic modus operandi. Instead of interpretations that are positioned on one hermeneutical horizontal axis, they opted for a division to different exegetical layers with each having its own interpretative key and hermeneutical tonality. Secondly, this hermeneutical activity is framed by the use of technical terms, for mostly the per, Zahir, and Bafen. Thirdly, we noted a gap between the programmatic assertions of some of the exegetes we've sur surveyed and their ex actual exegetical praxis. The reason, or more, most probably, more than one reason for the existence of this gap can only be, be speculated at this stage. And here I have my own speculations uh, that unfortunately time does not allow me uh, to share, to elaborate upon. In any case, in order to comprehend the exegetical activity of these figures, it will not suffice to look at it only from above by analyzing the, the programmatic statements. It must be also scrutinized from below, that is, by analyzing the actual verse-to-verse -verse exegetical praxis. Such a perspective reveals that multi-layered exegesis is used more than can be expected, and not only in cases in which the exegete runs into a contradiction between different verses or a specific theological problem such as anthropo anthropomorphism, but also in cases in which it is evident that the exegete seeks to enlarge the capacity of the verses to carry meanings that are not part of the original context and to arrange these meanings according to a specific exegetical layer. The emergence of this hermeneutical trend was to change the patterns of Jewish exegetical activities in a variety of ways. An interesting line of development, which I can only point to at this context, um, and which demands further exploration, is the uh, adoption and enhancement of this principle by several Jewish and the Lucy authors, such as Ravad Ibn Ezra in his continuous verse by verse commentary, Maimonides in his Guide of the Perplex that, ad that addresses, according to the definition of, his, of its author, the inner meaning of prophetical utterances, uh, the anonymous author of Kitab Mani Anafs, who seeks to interpret the inner meaning of biblical verses that refers to the soul uh, and others. All these authors repeat the principle that scripture has different layers of meaning, argue that each is to be interpreted according to its specific hermeneutical key, and use the notion of interiority to integrate different intellectual orientations and corpora of knowledge into inner Jewish discourses, associating them with the true meaning of scripture. Moreover, some of the restrictions that were set by previous, previous authors were breached by some of the Andalusi authors. And Barton was to be used not only locally, but as an all-encompassing principle. It is still too early to determine 
what role did the geonic and the karaite exegetical corpus played in the shaping of both an exegetical discourse in Al-Andalus. And this requires further work. But in any case, we can now see that Andalusi writings were not the source of the introduction of both and discourse in Jewish writings, as was suggested in scholarship, or the first to use the idea of multilayered exegesis. An earlier stratum of writing set the precedent and paved the way for integrating this principle into medieval Jewish exegesis. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Omer. We have time for one or two questions. And as Preston said by Margie, we give Buzzy the, the first right of questioning, but uh, perhaps one or two others as well. Yes, so let me first say uh, shalom, shalom, la karuva la rachok. A, a warm uh, greeting, uh, Omer. Thank you so much. This is Elisha. Um, I, I, I wanted to, uh, to thank you. Um, this is really an extension of your excellent uh, forthcoming book uh, on the interiority. There again, the, uh, the theme of the of Batin uh, prominently uh, featured. And, and there uh, you can see the extent to which uh, Bahir and Huda uh, used the notion of Batin both in an exegetical context as well as in a broader um, theological philosophical framework. Um, the, you alluded to, uh, this is just, uh, let me try to keep it brief, you alluded to um, two other key terms along the way, tafsir and ta'wil, and, um, and I really just want to maybe point to the significance of that first and foremost, um, in terms of the context, the background, uh, there, the, the, uh, those two terms really form a, um, an anchor in the, in the Islamic sources for a theoretical uh, um, uh, mapping of, of uh, scriptural exegesis, uh, where tafsir, I think you translated it as interpretation, and which is really associated more closely with, with the, uh, the, the, the zahir, the, the, uh, the external interpretation, the plain sense. Uh, where ta'wil is always associated with the non-literal in that sense. Uh, it, 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 to really unpack this, I, I think uh, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to look into the ways in which this is uh, developed in the Islamic sources, because they, that's really, they don't only deal with it at, um, uh, ad hoc, but they, they do so in a, uh, in a systematic manner, philosophical, uh, uh, um, uh, exegesis as, as well as non-philosophical. We also have, of course, the mystical tradition, and there they begin to use another term, which you start to see among the, the, uh, the, the Jewish pietists as well, um, uh, the, the notion of sir, asrar, that the, the, the secrets of, of scripture. So there's so many other ways to take this, but um, uh, it, it, the whole history of this, especially as, as, as it enters the Ant Ant Andalusi framework, really remains to be seen. It seems, it seems to me, and I'm curious what you think, that Rabbeinu Bakhi ibn Asher in his, in his commentary was, um, was producing something very novel and was uh, uh, not, uh, perhaps more indebted to, to the Christian context than to the, than to the Islamic in, in, in that sense, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Of course, Toda uh, Rabba Rabba, and I only I can only wish that we were together and could speak of, uh, 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 together for a long conversation that it deserves. Uh, very briefly, and uh, I hope that I've heard it all. Um, two things. One is with regards to uh, the, the the distinction between uh, tawil and tafsir, which is very much uh, uh, effective in many uh, Muslim discourses of the time, exegetical discourses, etc. As far as I can see, at least in Saadia uh, uh, and also in, in Shmuel Ben Hofni, it doesn't play this role. I mean, they use uh, Tawil and Tafsir almost interchangeably. As far as I can remember, without uh, making anything off distinguishing between these two, one that goes uh, beyond the, the more uh, literal meaning, etc., as 
um, Muslim authors of their time and as uh, authors of later times did, which is very interesting that Ta will, uh, uh, at, 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 when looked from Saadia's perspective, does not play the role of drawing further from the more contextual literal sense. Um, uh, in other, in later authors, we can see it uh, going uh, in, in, in more in this direction, but, but not 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 in in not in Saadia, not in Shmuel Ben Hofni. And with regards to the car rights, uh, it is a work that needs to be done, and uh, I have yet to do it at this stage. Uh, with regards to uh, 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 you, you mentioned Bachia, and of course I find find great interest in it, and he does declare. Uh, uh, in his Chovot uh, 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 that the idea of uh, scripture having both Zahir and Bafin is all-encompassing. It's not only in cases in which you uh, run across a theological problem or a contradiction that you have to look for the button, but the button is a level that always exists beneath the uh, more manifest sense of scripture, and it ties in with the fact that in whole of being, in many of being's aspects, there are manifest and non-manifest uh, um, layers that uh, interact with each other. What I found to be, and, and as you've mentioned, it seems that uh, Bachia is very much attentive to um, the voices that come from uh, Muslim realms, the Zud literature, uh, maybe some 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 Sufi uh, uh, literature, even though uh, far less convinced uh, in this case. Uh, uh, and and the question arises: uh, What does Bahia have to do with either the Geonic or Karaite uh, interpretations uh, uh, that preceded him? And here, when one looks into the way that Bahia works with verses in his own book, one can see uh, uh, this was the, at first bewildering to me and, 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 and then very much made sense. That uh, Bache is very attentive to the way scripture was interpreted before him. And he uses uh, uh, earlier inter uh, exegetes, uh, uh, interpretations of verses, not only Rabbanite, but also uh, 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 what has survived only in Karite interpretations. And uh, this is a very interesting case, uh, yet to be significantly explored. I only did some little work on it uh, with regards to Psalms. Um, and it ties in uh, with uh, what I now see more and more, which is the way that Karite exegesis infiltrated into Rabbanite discourses in Al-Andalus. Um, uh, and here we have a gap, a very interesting gap between the evidence that shows little to none, but not none, little uh, existence of, of Karaites in Al-Andalus, uh, uh, with the fact that Andalusi authors seems to be not only very irritated by the challenge of Karaism, but also when looked at uh, in higher resolution, attentive to uh, actual Karaites interpretation uh, of scripture. And, and I, I see a reason to um, uh, try to figure out if the discourse that um, distinguishes between Zahir and Baten that is at play in Karaites uh, uh, um, exegetical works may have infiltrated in this mode two to Rabbanite and the Lucy authors. Now, Omar, thank you very much. We, we are going to let you go into the night. Uh, there's troops from the night here today. Thank you very much. And, and, uh, to and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, join me in thanking.
drawing from a range of disciplines, she seeks to integrate both the critical treatment of tradition through its expert attentiveness to spiritual and experiential dimensions. Her latest book, Hatzedek Counter and the Torah, was a national Jewish book award finalist and is a wide-ranging study of 200 years of Hasidic homiletics. It draws creatively on modern thought, literary theory, and cultural history to demonstrate the contribution of Hasidic teaching to the Jewish hermeneutical tradition. Uh, as you know, uh, David Gottlieb, uh, our graduate here in the Divinity School, someone you've had contact with, will be reading Aura's uh, paper. So um, uh, welcome, David, uh, presenting Aura's paper. And thank you, Aura, for contributing this. I'm sorry you have to experience uh, Professor Wiskin's scholarship this way. Um, I'm willing to do whatever Sam Shankoff asks me, especially when it's in honor of our Professor Buzzy Fishbane. Um, I would ask that you for, forgive me for any mistakes in uh, pronunciation that I'm about to make, and I hope that I do honor both to Buzzy and to Aura's work. Aura asked that um, this prayer be read before the delivery of her paper. Achenu kol beit Yisrael hanetunim betzara uvashivya haomdim ben bayam uven bayavasha hamakom yerachem alechem vayotziyem mitzara lirvacha umeafela leora umish ibud legeula hashata baagala uvizman kariv imru amen. And she writes. As always, this wonderful invitation to engage with Professor Fishbane's slash Buzzy's work and thought has opened new vistas and set me off on yet another journey. Engaging with his writings enables me to better understand where I need to go in my own. As I prepared this talk, I was blessed with many moments of illumination and profound learning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share some of them with you today. My title comes from T.S. Eliot's poem, Four Quartets, quote, words after speech reach into the silence, a line that has accompanied me many years across oceans and worlds of being. Words gesture to spiritual dimensions beyond their literal meaning, beyond sense apprehension. Words bear many resonance, resonances, literal, metaphorical, ethical, mystical. T.S. Eliot and his poetry works in and with experiences that might lead to a flash of spiritual vision. Those that he evokes in the quartets are of the moment and of a lifetime. Moments that can never be utterly forgotten nor completely recaptured, repeated, or reproduced. Yet they survive in a larger whole of experience. It is that larger whole that Eliot seeks to evoke and to revisit in the dream visions that haunt his works. But what essential meaning distinguishes between words and speech? Words after speech reach into the silence. Fishbane tells us that, quote, words create speech events which provide a habitation for consciousness on earth. Enable, unquote, enable us to make sense of our lives to ourselves and with others through language. Now language, he explains, is, and again I quote, both a symbolic form that abstracts us from the brute facticity of things and the means for their spiritual appropriation and internalization. We weave our lives into a web of words, like spiders who spin their creations from within themselves and trap realities in these very meshes. From moment to moment, in both silent monologue and social discourse, across the divides of time as we learn about the past and communicate it. That's from Sacred Attunement. The metaphor is compelling. Words trap reality spun into thread, woven together in the warp and weft of life itself, a texture emerges, language, monologue, discourse. Through language, the things may somehow be appropriated and internalized. Finally, we might communicate what they have taught us. The things, les choses, die Dinge, hadvarim, a hadvarim. Ela hadvarim asher diber Moshe el kol Yisrael be'ever hayarden b'amidbar ba'arava. Hadvarim, the things. These are the words. Indeed, Rainer Maria Rilke, a first love that Buzzy and I share, has taught us through his poetry, and perhaps in the Duino elegies most of all, how we may seek the depths of things in which the eternal endures. <clears throat> 
For the wanderer doesn't bring a handful of that unutterable earth from the mountainside down to the valley, but only some word he's earned, a pure word, the yellow and blue gentian. Maybe we're here only to say house, bridge, well, gate, jug, olive tree, window, at most, pillar, tower. But to say them, remember, oh, to say them in a way that the things themselves never dreamed of existing so intensely. The things in Rilke's poems are numinous images, images that celebrate the awesome mystery of life, love, and death. As a poet, he knew that the spiritual realm alone is the source of ultimate meaning. Writing the Duino elegies, Rilke said that he began to under task, understand the task of art not so much as that of representing reality, but of transforming it into what he termed das Unsichtbar, the invisible or the Im imaginary. The task of the poet, he believed, was to rescue external reality before it vanished away by reconfiguring it as abstract structure. My encounter with Buzzy's writings has many times brought me face to face with both the power and with the limitations of words. His slash your struggle with language, the difficulty of your prose, though through it we sense a soul's search for something holy, pure, vitally true. The only recourse can be to the sacred works of Jewish tradition. For God's word, quote, constitutes the inherent vitality of all things, above and below the thresholds of human consciousness, and their power is immense. Hallo, kol divrai, ke'esh ne'um Hashem. Behold, my word is like fire, says the Lord. Immerse yourself in it, emerge. Immerse yourself in it and emerge. Purified. A word about my use of images today. I'm trying to develop or work out a phenomenological approach to Jewish religious tradition and spirituality. One that I believe is immediately akin to an approach developed in the Jungian tradition to the arts. Emotional engagement here is essential. The promise or the hope is that we, we may be open to encounters as powerful and as encompassing as religious experience can be. There are no words in these images. Rather, I, guided by the artists who created them, will evoke the words that inform and inspire them. And so the painter, Ruth Feldman, named this work, Pure Water, Holy Fire. Those presences, water, its transformative power and clear blue depths, fire embodying luminosity, sparks, the sacred, awe, recall, quote, God's ever-present revelation in the world, in all its spectacular and imposing vitality and human hermeneutical freedom, ever representing new perceptions of existence, unquote. As Buzzy put it, referring to Cezanne and to Clay, quote, these painters return us to the mystery of line and light and the colors and contours so often concealed from our everyday mind. Their achievements remind us of our hermeneutical responsibilities to heed the primary shapes of the life forms we encounter and to call them to mind. Fishbane's inquiring spirit, his imaginative sensibilities, his keen eye for the suggestive, suggestive detail have shaped and inspired scholarship in so many areas of Jewish studies. Like the artists and mystical poets he acclaims, Buzzy has honed the tools we need to read the surface of texts of the world and of human experience while intimating the implicit subtext, the layers of meaning that are embodied within yet indiscernible to the naked eye. Just as any good therapist is obliged to read the surface of presentations and discern the hidden wounds and motives, then intimate from them the paths of healing, so the spiritually sensitive person recalls in the words of the surrealist poet Paul Eluard, there is another world, and it is this one. Today, I want to consider the ways we may gain a deeper sense of Jewish spiritual practice through Hasidic commentary. At the heart of Hasidic teaching is a spiritual quest driven by the desire to cross thresholds, opening out onto new uncharted realms. Hermeneutics plays a key role here. Exegesis equals searching out deeper meaning of a text theological, ethical, mystical, existential. The sermon, or drasha, l'idrosh, le chapes, 
In the course of my reflections today, I would like to think about what we're doing as we seek out meaning to consider the hermeneutical dimension of our inquiry. I'll also attend to modes of reading, to the Hasidic master's sense of metaphor and poetic language, roles of imagination, cognition, and the self, dynamics of interpretation. These Hasidic sources clearly belong to the Jewish religious tradition. Still, I believe they can perhaps even wish to be read in a broader context. Recall that Jung often affirmed his belief that the term religion does not come from the Latin, wor come from the Latin word religare, which means to link or to attach, as the church fathers would have it. For them, it implies attaching oneself to God, of course. Rather, Jung takes the word religion in the sense that Cicero uses, for whom the word religio, religion, comes not from relegare, to attach, but from religere, or relegere, which means to reread attentively, to observe once again, to reconsider, to rethink. <clears throat> the first teaching is by Reb Mordechai Yosef Leiner of Izbitza, the Meha Shiloa lived from 1800 to 1854. He was a disciple of Reb Simcha Bunim of Sizusha, an innovative thinker who forged a radically new direction for Hasidism in Poland in the first decades of the 19th century. The Sizucha school developed a theological and philosophical vocabulary that sought to address the most pressing concerns of contemporary Jewish religious life and the complex challenges of modernity. Particularly striking are the innovative hermeneutical concepts I'm sorry, the innovative hermeneutical aspects of their teachings. That is the creative ways in which these Hasidic masters read the Torah through the prisms of self and world. You have the Hebrew text in your source sheets. Did people get, uh... no, Never mind. we'll carry on. The starting point of this discourse is the Torah portion Shalach Lecha, the incident in which spies set out to scout the land of Canaan. But the master's thoughts quickly spiral onward. So it is written, open my eyes that I may perceive the wonders of your teaching. And the Zohar adds, that which is beneath the garments of the Torah. Ma de tachot levushad oraita. In a word, Reb Mordechai Yosef evokes or describes the mode of exegesis called sod. Here, as Buzzi has taught us, the biblical text is shown to be the outer garment of ever deeper layers of divine spirit and soul. Indeed, scripture is even transformed into the template of all reality into nothing less than the ultimate code of divinity itself. And thus, the mystical adept, or maybe any learner as well, who driven by pure desire, longs to understand more, such an individual, quote, may transcend the visible patterns of existential reality to higher spiritual levels. Mystical hermeneutics is the bridge to the beyond. We skip a few lines of the sermon, return to them later. Reb Mordechai Yosef continues, for the holy matters, divrei Torah, buried in the silence of things, badomem, seem to be totally hidden, undetectable. Even holy matters that appear to be explicit, their preciousness is not readily visible. On the face of it, they look like a burden, a heavy task. Yet a person who seeks Hashem can pray that God uncover their eyes and grant them a glimpse of the wonders of your teaching, of that which is beneath the garments of Torah. And then suddenly one sees that inside they are charged with love. It is an evocative metaphor. The levush, garment, externality, veils the form within or beneath it. The pnimiut, or inwardness. Note the implicit dialectic here. The relative value of these two planes of existence, surface and below the surface, appearances and quote unquote reality. What is hidden, concealed, veiled, is most precious of all. Inanimate, silent things, domem, are in truth charged with holiness. But in a strange, even paradoxical, logical reversal, the Hasidic master declares that the same is true of straightforward, quote unquote, holy matters. Every aspect of the Torah, explicit, clear, evident, meforash, though they seem, in fact, conceal hidden depths of meaning. What is needed then is, yes, sacred attunement an actively engaged mindfulness of this vital dialectic of appearances and their higher concealed spiritual essence. But there is more. Let's go back to the lines we skipped. 
quote, for the root essence of the land of Israel is that their holy matters, divrei Torah, are patently evident. This is a land that your God looks after always. Hashem Elohecha doresh ota tamid. His rereading, of course, turns on the word doresh. Its primary meaning is to inquire, research, examine. Yet doresh alludes as well to the creative rabbinical mode of exposition called drash, that mode of reading and consciousness by which we, quote, seek God through God's creative word in the world and interpreted instructions in scripture, unquote. Fishbane rhetorically asks, and again I quote, who then guides the hand of interpretation? Ultimately, it is God alone. Here, the mode of being that our Hasidic master seeks to describe and convey as a living practice is in truth embodied, as it were, by the Holy Blessed One. God's active engagement with the promised land models the qualities of drash, an ongoing mindfulness of the ways in which, quote, the living God is realized and named in the common world, unquote. The desire, prayer, and yearning to know more, to glimpse what is beneath the veil, all these are, quote, the bridge to the beyond, unquote. We now turn to a second discourse, historically earlier than the Mehashiloah. Here is a foundational teaching by the master, uh, Reb Dov Ber, the Magid of Mezrich. You have it on your source sheet, which you actually don't. This complex and innovative discourse is founded on the same verse we have been considering, Israel, a land that your God looks after always. Eretz asher yachem elochecha doresh otatamid. The Magid opens with a basic principle of mystical exegesis. Each word of the holy tongue summons us to seek out its root, the source in supernal realms from which it draws vitality. So for example, the word doresh, a scholar examines, researches the matter, probes its meaning. And thus the prophet Jeremiah lamented, she is thine, there is none that seeks her. Zion, Doresh Enla. On its plain meaning, in this verse, the prophet evokes the feminine image of Zion, Jerusalem, in exile, destitute, outcast, seemingly forgotten. But the sages inferred, sought out by no one, hence we learn that Zion requires seeking. Ve'amar Zion, Doresh Enla, Miklau Dva'aya Drisha. The practical solution that the rabbis propose is this. While the temple lies in ruin, they will institute ordinances to commemorate it to ensure that Zion will always be sought out, remembered, present to our awareness. <clears throat> Zion, 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 Siman. With a graceful leap, an inspired moment of hermeneutical freedom, the Hasidic master now declares that the tzaddik himself in his very being is called Zion, Zion. A strange proof text comes to reinforce this. In the Zohar of himself, Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, Rashbi averse, Ana Simna Be'alma. Now pay close attention. On its rabbinical sense, Simna Be'alma is an unassuming prosaic mark, a mere sign. So for instance, on the topic of signatures, the Talmud says that the Rav, that Rav would sign his name with the figure of a fish. Rabbi Hanina would draw a palm branch. Rabbi Hoshaya just wrote the letter Ayn, a simple sign, a cipher. But in the Zohar, the phrase Simna Be'alma is transformed. Rashbi says Ana Simna Be'alma. Here it means I am a sign for the world. Or perhaps, in this world, I am master of signifiers. I will try to explain. Ana Simna Be'alma. As tzaddik, I have been charged with the responsibility to search for meaning. For the signs, Tzion slash Tziyun, they must be sought out, their meaning discovered. Miklau dva'ayad The imperative here for the tzaddik is thus to devote himself tirelessly to acts of interpretation. The tzaddik, in his essence, embodies semiotic engagement. His earthly role in his cosmic mission is to translate the signs, to connect signifier and signified to bridge between this world of appearances and higher concealed spheres of reality, to draw down holiness from those upper realms, and finally, of course, to engender repair, tikkun, for this world below. Through his valiant hermeneutical efforts, this holy individual, or tzaddik, has the power to overturn divine judgments and transform them into blessings of compassion and peace. Now hold on tight, Aura says. A story comes to prove the point. 
The Magid recalls what happened during the reign of the righteous King Josiah, Yoshiyahu. Briefly, the king is informed that a Torah scroll has been discovered in the temple, temple, a remnant that miraculously survived the scourge of evil King Manasseh, his father, who had sought to erase all memory of the law. Nearly 70 years have passed since his idolatrous reign of terror began, and the words of the covenant have been nearly forgotten. The royal scribe reads the roll to him, and the king rends his clothing. Quote, surely the wrath of the Lord has been ignited against us, for our fathers violated the words of this book, unquote. King Josiah then sends messengers to Jerusalem to seek out the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, so that she may interpret his portentous sign. Yet the Magid notes, the rabbis are perplexed. Why did the king appeal to Huldah the prophet, prophetess and not to Jeremiah, who was after all the most prominent prophet of the day and her cousin, nor to any other male prophet then in Jerusalem? And they explain, Mipne hanashim rachmaniyotem, because women are compassionate. But what kind of answer is that? Challenges the Magid. Quote, what does feminine compassion have to do with it? Isn't a prophet compelled to convey the word of God just as it is? But no, the Magid explains. Although the letters of prophecy were received by every prophet equally in identical form, nonetheless, every individual prophet has the power to transmute them, to transform their meaning from judgment to mercy. Now men, by nature, are not merciful like women are, and so a male prophet would have been unable to soften the words. He would have fought zealously for God's honor, for he too would have burned with fury against evildoers. But a woman, she knows about compassion. And so the message sent back to King Josiah filtered through the sensibility of Huldah the prophetess, wife of peace, Shalom, son of hope, Tikvah, is colored with mercy. The temple will be destroyed, the Jewish people exiled, but Huldah adds in the name of God, because your heart is contrite and you humbled yourself before Hashem, when you heard that which I have spoken about this place, that they would become a desolation and a curse, you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see the impending disaster and ruin. End of story. Now, the question that truly concerns the Magid Reb Dov Ber is this. How can it be that the tzaddik, like his prototype, the prophet, is able to recombine the divine letters to reform them into other words of speech, dibur. What grants the tzaddik that nearly unimaginable power so very akin to prophecy in this Hasidic understanding of it? Both of them, the Magid explains, first appeal to God to grant them lishon limudim after Isaiah 50, verse 4. In other words, ultimately, the tzaddik, like gracious Hulda, is driven by the desire to remind, as it were, God of our merits, of the undying spark of goodness in every Jewish heart, and to plead in defense of the Jewish people. And so, commensurate with their will to turn harsh, harsh judgment to mercy, God gives the tzaddikim, slash the prophets, the insight, the interpretation needed to enable that transformation. Lashon. Language, words chosen with compassion can engender meaning. Words have the power to create and to transform reality. But that is not all, although she says here that she's almost finished. The Magid revisits this motif, Zion sought out by no one. Hence we learn that Zion requires seeking. Zion he doresh en la miklal dvaya drisha. In another teaching with a new insight, a further development that resonates deeply with Fishbane's own life's work. Here it is not only the prophet, not only the mystic, not only the tzaddik, but each of us who is summoned to the task of interpretation, to search out the meaning of the signs. For every individual, the Magid of Urs is a microcosm, olan katan, and so every dimension of oneself, each moment of one's life, indeed every aspect of being is there to be sought out mindfully considered, its depths of meaning explored. It is an encompassing, all-consuming, never-ending mission, and one that must concern us always. Yet as Buzzy has reassured us, lovingly, patiently, insistently, the recompense is immense. To attain that mode of perception, to regard ourselves and each of the myriad phenomena of our world as a tziyun, a sign pointing beyond itself, 
the transformed awareness promises, as he puts it, to, quote, guide spiritual vision in the everyday and give new depth to religious thought and behavior, to extend our vision to the most expansive vistas of theological meaning and significance, unquote. Professor Michael Fishbane has entrusted us with a monumental legacy. We, his students and colleagues, friends and family, have gathered here to reflect further, each of us through the prism of our own being, on the methods and insights at the heart of his work. As I gathered my thoughts in preparing this talk, the truly unexpected encounter with the figure of Hulda and the feminine mode of rereading that she embodies has helped me to understand something important about Buzzy's work and what it has meant for me. In one of the many moving passages near the end of Fragile Finitude, he writes, quote, opened to the gifts of heaven, the self becomes a channel of blessing. The reborn soul will see and speak anew to others, and they in turn will find renewed forms of expression. The hands that gather the beneficence of God will extend this bounty to the needy with loving care, and the heart that has been opened in marvel will receive reflections from highest heaven and refract that light selflessly to other hearts nearby. Wonder unbinds. It is a chesed, a source of life. And so he concludes, we may re-find God's gracious presence so vitally embodied in created existence." Unquote. Now, perhaps more than ever, the world needs rachmanut, mercy, compassion, not only from above but also, maybe most of all, from here, below, in our country, our communities, our classrooms, our homes, our hearts. Thank you, Buzzy, for showing us the way. Be'or or, by your light, may we see light. <laughs>